God understands us best. He understands all the dynamics of who we are. And that's why he has given his word to penetrate into the very fabric of our being of both spirit and body and mind and helps us to realize how important it is that we understand ourselves through the eyes of God. beautiful special music this morning and very touching um, you know for the last several weeks during the summertime I had all the kids in here so I was doing object lessons you know so when I got to the message today I thought you know I don't have the kids in here but we all have some kid at heart now I've got a, maybe a few here that want to stay with mom or dad or whatever but uh, anyway I have an object I was really, really wondering if I was going to be able to find one of these because I didn't have one. What I have here is a two-edged sword. It's antique. And I got to tell you, there's a little story behind this. You know, sometimes when you're looking for something really weird, or different, you don't see on the shelf at Walmart, you know, you, you, you have to go hunt for it, and uh, so I had no idea where I was going to find a two-edged sword, so I put it to the Lord, and I prayed, and then somebody's name popped into my mind, and this person is somebody who goes to a lot of yard sales, you know, some of you like to do that kind of thing. And this is sort of a hobby of hers. So I called Sandy Osborne and I asked Sandy, I said, Sandy, by any chance, do you have a two-edged sword? And, and she said, Pastor, I think I do. <laughs> but I'm not sure. I haven't seen it in a while and I have it in storage somewhere, so I'm going to have to look for it. Well, to make a long story short, she found it. And uh, I have it this morning. Now, the reason why the two-edged sword is that uh, we are told in Scripture that the Bible, the Word of God, is sharper than any, what? Two-edged sword. So it will pierce, right? Much easier if it's sharp on both sides. So this morning, we have this sword to represent God's word because that's what we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to talk about what the word of God says about itself and how important and unique and special the word of God is. So I'm going to put this, this sword up here by the Bible. You know, we have a Bible displayed on the communion table because this is central to everything we do here as a church. We're about preaching the Word of God. We're about teaching the Word of God. So everything that we do around here comes back to this book. You know, and, and it's, this is foundational to who we are as the people of God. In fact, Baptists have been called a people of the book, and that's a good title. I like that. I don't know. We haven't really used it a whole lot, but we are. We're truly a people of the book, and the book, of course, is the Word of God. And so it is what? Sharper than any two-edged sword. Where we're going to find in Scripture that it also teaches us a whole lot more about why God's Word is so unique. And from two verses of Scripture, we're going to find ten unique qualities about God's Word. Ten. You're going to find in these two verses alone. And we're going to look at them in just a moment. But before we do, I would like for us to go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you because you are truly an awesome God. And Lord, thank you for how you've given us your, your word. How through the Holy Spirit, you inspired men to record your word. And Lord, we are thankful for how they were collected and canonized. So that we have these 66 books before us. 
that we refer to as the Bible, the Holy Bible. Holy because they're set apart from all others, different, unique from every other kind of book. And so, Father, we do pray this morning, as we open your word of truth, that your word will become extra special to us today. That it will be more than a, a book to be displayed in our house, but, Lord, a book to be read, studied, and applied to our lives that will become truly living through us. Thank you, Father, for your word of truth. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who has protected it through the years and has made it available to us. Thank you, Lord, for this occasion that we can listen to what you have to teach us through your word about your word. Thank you, Father, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to turn with, uh, with me to our first text found in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Here, the writer of Hebrews is going to be telling us some things about the Word of God. So let us look at this verse and examine it uh, carefully. And here we read, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So we're going to take a look at these five qualities that we see here in this verse before we look at a second verse found in the writings of the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. But let's look at these, this verse again. First of all, we see that the Word of God is unique because, first of all, it is living. William Barclay has pointed out how Isaiah, the prophet, has indicated to us the, about the Word of God. He said, when the prophet Isaiah heard God speak, he heard God say that the Word which went out of his mouth would, would never be ineffective. It would always do that which God designated it to do. In other words, we see how the prophet makes it very clear that when he speaks in Isaiah 55 verses 10 and 11, that his word is not going to come back empty. That when he speaks, it is going to happen. In other words, we can bank on anything and everything that God tells us in his word. And this is so important because we have a source of stability. We have a source of security in the word of God. We find in the promises of God is the basis for which we understand our salvation and are given the guarantee of it. In other words, our feelings can go up and down like a roller coaster ride, but the Word of God is something that is stable, that is constant, and will give us that stability in the midst of our times of doubt and questioning. When we are reading the promises of God, it reassures us of what God's going to do. That if we believe in Him, He will give us everlasting life. That in the Father's house, Jesus would say, there are many mansions. And if it weren't so, he would have told us. He said he's going there to prepare a place for us. Guess what? We have the assurance of a special place in heaven that Jesus prepared for us. When we're reading the promises of God, we can bank on it because God is not going to renege on his word. His word is not going to come back empty or void. Next thing, Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 33, or 35, he said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. They're living and they're going to be continuing to live. So we have the stability as Christians. We have a basis for our assurance of our salvation. We have the, the tool by which God has used to inspire, to help us to understand that when he speaks, 
He acts. Now, secondly, we must understand here in this verse in Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 12, how the Word of God is unique because it is also active. The Word of God is not only something to be uh, read and examined and, and, and studied, but it is something to be acted on, applied, and done. Its intention is never just to inform us and to enlighten us, but to change us, to recreate us, to enable us to put our faith in Him. That's why we find in Scripture that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So it's the Word of God that's the Holy Spirit that inspired it, inspires us to understand God and understand His, His purpose and His plan for us, to understand that He has something much better for us in life. So I suggest blowing the dust off your Bible and open it up and get into a regular reading and study and application time with God. Because nothing is going to help you more than your special time with God in prayer and in His Word. And so I was given a challenge when I was a young person. I remember that camp vividly like it happened yesterday. And yet it happened when I was 13 years old. And now I'm going to soon be 69. So that was a long time ago. But I remember the occasion on this youth re retreat we were at a place called the Circle F Dude Ranch in Lake Wales, Florida. We were having a great time enjoying all of the facilities there, horseback riding, going out swimming in the lake and all of that kind of good stuff. But we also had some very serious times in God's word. And I remember one, one, one of the occasion in which the pastor was sharing with us and he gave us this challenge. He said, you know, I wanna ask all of you with your heads bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around, how many of you will, will agree to read your Bible, make a commitment to read your Bible every day for at least five minutes and have a time of prayer? And if you will make that kind of commitment, I want to pray for you, I want you to raise your hand. So I raised my hand and I put it back down. And I remember making that commitment when I was 13 years old and with very few exceptions, I've kept that commitment all these years. And I know that God's word does not come back void. I know that God's word is a living word. And I know that God's word is active. And it's active in me. And I know that it can be active in every one of us as we allow God's word to take root in our minds and hearts and become a primary part of our life and who we are as God's people, that we can truly be a people of the book. But we must understand more. In this scripture passage, we're told that it is sharper than any double-edged sword. In other words, it speaks of, of both God's love and his grace, and, but not that alone. That's one edge. That's one facet of what God's word does. It, it, it is helpful to us in understanding God as a God of love and, and grace and mercy. But there's another blade. There's another side to the sword. And that is God's wrath, God's judgment. It also penetrates and helps us to understand that God is both a loving God, but he's also a God who is just and will bring judgment upon us that sin and rebel against him. So we must understand the two-faceted part of it. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart as well. So it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. In other words, it's, it's penetrating into the very being of who we are, physically and spiritually. So the word of God, it penetrates to the very center of our being and it gets through all of the facade and it helps us to understand the spiritual side of us as well as our physical side because we're integrated mind, body, and spirit. And so it's important that God understands us best. 
He understands all the dynamics of who we are. And that's why he has given his word to penetrate into the very fabric of our being of both spirit and body and mind and helps us to realize how important it is that we understand ourselves through the eyes of God. For you see, God understands not only what we do, but why we do it. He understands our motives, in other words. And the word of God helps us to see and re reveals who and why we do what we do. You know, there's only two people that really understand really what's going on inside of us. Only two. Only two. You and God. You and God. Because everybody else, you may give a clue as to who you are. You may reveal a lot of who you are and what you do and how you talk and what you say and where you spend your time and your money. But who really knows you best is God. Why? Because he made you. He created you. You were, you were made, created in your mother's womb. And you, are, you were fearfully and wonderfully made. And so as a reason, as because of that, God understands us, understands us best. And so we must always realize and trust the Lord to do what he wants us to do as we serve him. Also, we must understand that God's word gives us a understanding of what he wants us to be about as his people. Let's look at 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. Flip over a few pages backward, back towards the Old Testament from Hebrews, you will find the letter of 2 Timothy. In the letter of 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 16, we read these words. All scripture is God-breathed, inspired in other words, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So here, what we're going to see is that God's word is unique because also it is inspired or God-breathed. In other words, God has put himself into it. God is the author of the, the writings of scripture. He used human instruments. He used the personalities integrated into the writings of the scripture, but he breathed into it. He directed its writing so that it is different than any other writing because its author is God himself. It is inspired by the Holy Spirit, God's presence in spirit to enlighten and to show what was needed to be recorded so that we can have the wisdom of God, the understanding of God, and the revelation of God. And then too, we see that the word of God is unique because it does these things. First, it is useful for teaching, it says here. Now, the word of God is going to instruct us, in other words. It's going to inform us. Now, we depend upon, when we're in a classroom, we're dependent upon the teacher and to, to, to help us. But also the teacher will use a textbook for different subjects to inform and enlighten uh, us about that particular area of, of interest or concern. And so the teacher is revealing or giving information. Well, the Word of God provides us a lot of information. It teaches us, in other words, it teaches us things about God himself. It teaches us about his will for our life. How could we really understand the will of God without understanding the Word of God? The will of God is revealed to us in the Word of God as we pray and search the scriptures, God will enlighten us to understand what his will is for us. How I grew to understand what God wanted me to do was that little time I was spending with God every day in his word and in prayer. And then all of a sudden one day, it came to me while I was on my knees in prayer that God wanted me to be a pastor. I was scared 
But I knew and I was convinced that this was what God wanted me to do. He didn't write it in the, in the sky. It wasn't, it wasn't chiseled out in a stone. Uh, but it was embedded in my heart by the Holy Spirit that this was what I was to do. And then as I was praying about it and I shared my decision with the church family, I came home that night and my parents, I wasn't sure how they were going to take all of this because they were hearing it as the church heard it. I did not share this with them prior to sharing it with the church. And then when I came home, I remember my mom coming into my room with tears streaming down her cheeks. And she said, son, I have never told you something, but I'm going to tell you now. When you were a baby, I dedicated you to the Lord for his service and his work. And I just felt like now's the time to tell you that. And so, you know, it was like an affirmation that, that God had given to me through my mother. But I also know that we are able to fulfill the will of God as we continue to stay in the word of God. We're, it's not automatic that we're going to do the will of God on our own. We can't. We must have God's help. And God provides us that help through his word. He gives us his word to, to teach us to show us what he wants us to do and to be. But here is something else that we are also see in this verse of scripture in 2 Timothy 3.16, that it is useful for rebuking. Now, do you like to be rebuked? <laughs> no, we don't like to be rebuked. Someone was saying, Pastor, why in the world is rebuke me? I say, okay, well, let's think about it a little bit. To be rebuked is to be shown something you're doing wrong that can be very detrimental to you, okay? It can be like a child getting too close to something dangerous, like a hot stove or something. And, and a mother or a father will say to that child, don't get too close to that stove, you're going to get burned. And so the child is being rebuked, strongly warned about impending danger. God's word gives us words that will warn us and give us an indication that if we stay on this track, we're going to suffer the consequences and we're going to get burned. So the word of God will rebuke us. It will warn us strongly of impending danger to stay away from it. And then we must also understand that the word of God is unique too because it corrects us. It corrects us. Not only does it tell us what we're doing that, that can, can hurt us and be dangerous, and, and harm us, but it also, it corrects us. In other words, it shows us the right way to do things, okay? So it not only rebukes, but it also corrects us. Okay, instead of doing it this way, you need to do it this way. If you continue doing it this way, you're going to suffer consequences. But if you will do it my way, these are the blessings you can have. So it's correcting us. In other words, it's showing us the right way to live life God's way. And so by doing that, it's helping us to grow in our understanding of God and what his plan and purpose is for us. God does not want us to remain as little babies. He wants us to grow up. So how do we grow up? But to study and spend time with God and his word and allow his Holy Spirit who inspired it to inspire, illuminate our minds and hearts to understanding what his plan, his purpose is for us, to let it instruct us, to rebuke us, and to correct us. But one other thing, to train us in righteousness. You know, we all need some training, don't we? If you are going to do anything in life worthwhile, you're going to have to go through some training. If you're going to be a nurse, would you want a nurse just to walk into your room without having been trained and give you a shot? You wouldn't even want them to take your blood pressure. They made too much, much pressure on that arm and strangle you some way or something. But we must understand that nurses have to go through training to be a nurse. If, if you're going to be a mechanic, would you take your car to a mechanic who's never had training? Now, some of us may have taken our car to a mechanic that didn't have much training. And, and we, we said, you know what I'm getting, where I'm going with this. Training is vital. You want somebody that has training and experience 
to work on your car. All right? You want somebody that's trained and experienced to work on your body. If they, you need an operation and you need to be cared for. So training is vital to be effective and useful. And as Christians, God's word trains us. It's the manual for training to be the person God has called you to be. So if you think things are going awry in your life, you may need to check out the manual. Now, I've tinkered with my car enough to know I'm not a mechanic. My father was, but that doesn't make me one, all right? Except I could do some things I learned from my father, and I got some experience on minor stuff. And, but he did teach me something. He said, well, if you want to find out how something is done, check out the manual. Okay, so even mechanics, I find that even professional mechanics will say, I'm going to have to check the manual on this. In other words, the manual is a source of information that will guide you to understanding so you can do what needs to be done to correct the problem. Why is the manual important? Because it's the manufacturer who understands all the parts and put the manual together. When you buy a new vehicle, you get a manual with it. And if you buy a used vehicle, you should hope that the manual is still in the glove compartment. Or you may have a problem and need it someday. I had that problem with a car recently, and I had to go online to find a used manual for the car so I would have its availability of information so when something needed to be fixed, I had the manual. Guess what? God's Word is the manual for life that God has provided us to enable us to be able to do what He wants to do with us. We know that God's Word is the inspired Word of God. It is inspired because of all of these things that we've shared with you about today and it's because God wants you to experience his best. He wants you to have the blessings that he designed you to experience in life. He wants you to know him and have a personal relationship with him. He reveals all of this in his word of truth. If you've never gotten into the word of God, I would really encourage you to do so. We have Bible study every Sunday morning at 9.30 with some wonderful teachers that would love you to be in their class. If you haven't actually got involved in a Bible study group, I would really encourage you to do so. We have Wednesday night, we have Bible study, young adults. I teach a Bible study in the, in the, uh, uh, in the library. And, and we have Bible study for, for the youth uh, that Ms. Kimi leads. We have Bible study groups that some Sunday school offers uh, extended Bible study. Uh, at different occasions and different times. So there's plenty of opportunities to study God's word with others, but I also want to say that you need your private time with God as well. So I want to encourage each and every one of you to realize that the sword of the spirit is the word of God. And it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And it will help you in every area of your life to find what God's best is for you. If you'll just spend some time in it, you will discover it's got great wisdom and much help for you to find out what God wants you to be and to do as his person. May we pray. Father, we thank you for this morning and for the opportunity we have to reflect on what you teach us about your holy word. Father, we see so clearly that you want us to know you and have a personal relationship with you, to grow in that relationship, to understand your will and your way, to have the understanding that you want us to be well equipped to do every good work. You want to train us up to be able to do that. And Father, we know that you are working and want to work through us and in, inside of us by way of your word. So, Father, we do pray that we will spend more time with you, giving attention 
to your word and allowing it to penetrate our hearts and minds so that we can discover what your special purpose and plan is for our life. So Father, if the word is not a regular daily part of our lives, help us Lord today to, to take the challenge to begin reading your word and allowing you to speak to us through your word. Thank you, Father, for everything you've already done and what you have already taught us in your word. So help us to go to a deeper level of understanding, not only having knowledge of your word, but applying it and allowing it to affect our activity, our, our decision making, that what we do, Father, would be a reflection of your principles and teachings that you've given us in your word. So, Father, help us to use the sword of the Spirit and allowing it to penetrate us, to be the people you want us to be. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.